All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the book club AMA with the lovely Mark Schwartz. Good morning, Mark. How are you doing? I am doing great. I'm already yeah. this AMA. You are pumped. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to just start with a brief question while we kind of let everyone come in. Um, but can you just quickly let everyone know why you wrote a book on bureaucracy? Isn't it obvious why somebody would write a book on bureaucracy? Uh, that's, that's what I ask myself, you know, why has nobody written this book before? So uh, I, I spent seven years in the federal government in Homeland Security, and it turns out the federal government is somewhat bureaucratic. And um, yeah, somewhat. And uh, by being in the middle of it, it made me think quite a lot about bureaucracy and how it works and um, where it uh, is sometimes effective and where it gets in the way. And I had to find ways to overcome the bureaucratic impediments, especially around the digital transformations we were trying to do. Uh, and uh, it occurred to me that I could share some of not only those techniques, but also the thinking behind bureaucracy and um, how, to, how to cope with it uh, when it's in the way. So that's why I wrote the book. Well, great. Okay, so we're gonna jump into some of the questions from our attendees today. Um, I know we have a short amount of time with you today, so we're gonna get through as many as we can, but if we don't get through them all, We'll be sending those questions over to Mark after the AMA and hopefully he'll be able to answer them in written form at a later time and we'll share them with all of you. So first question from the audience, Mark. Has the management instruction approach been adopted in other US federal agencies? Not as far as I know, but I wouldn't know really. Um, so we were, um, we, we uh, saw it as a responsibility of our agency to publicize some of the techniques that we used, especially because we were, we were in a unique position of being a fee-funded agency, meaning that our budget didn't come from an appropriation by Congress. It came, we were funded out of the, the agency's revenues themselves. So, you know, since this was immigration, you would pay something to get a green card, you'd pay something for naturalization, and those fees became our budget. Uh, so the result of that was that uh, where other agencies were seeing frequent budget cuts and lots of politicking around their money, we didn't quite have that same pressure and we could try a lot more experiments um, and, and um, bring in new techniques more quickly than anybody else. So we figured it was our responsibility to let the rest of the government know what we were doing and how it was working. And uh, we hosted a lot of sessions where they could come in and, and learn from my team. We spoke at a lot of conferences and events, and we certainly told people about this approach. Now, I would have no way of knowing really if they wound up following it themselves or if they used other approaches. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully they try to take some of your advice. Yeah, I really recommend this. <laughs> <laughs> if nothing else, it's it's good for a laugh or two. Oh, yes, of course. And that's always good. All right, next question. How do you make sure the self-service vending machine is full of tools that developers love and want to use? Mm -hmm. What process do you use to update the selection? Mm -hmm. um, so like almost anything in DevOps and, and other contemporary digital approaches, fast feedback cycles are the really important thing. So uh, whoever is creating the vending machine, let's say whoever is, is uh, providing the platform, one of the things that they need to do to be successful is monitor and oversee how effective their platform is for the teams, the DevOps teams that are, that are building based on that platform. So I think of it as two organizations that are incentivized a little bit differently, but share a lot of skills. So you have your DevOps teams. When I say incentivized, by the way, I don't necessarily mean financial bonus incentives or anything like that. I mean, you know, they're, they're North Star, the thing that they're fighting for, shooting for. The DevOps teams are shooting for speed, uh, fast feedback on product features or the capabilities that they're building getting to market quickly, um, 
uh, constantly tweaking and improving their product and things like that. That's what the DevOps teams are doing. The platform team's incentive or goal is to speed up those DevOps teams. And so whether they're accomplishing their goal or not, uh, the only way to know is to observe how their platform is being used by the DevOps teams and whether it actually is speeding them up or not. And that's the fast feedback cycle that they need to work with. Now, um, I also think it's important that uh, we don't think of these as the tr traditional silos of infrastructure as the platform team and development as the DevOps teams. That's not the idea here. Both organizations have cross-functional teams with all of the different skill sets. It's just that their goals are different or their incentives are different. So that implies that on the platform side, you also have software developers, testers, you know, all these other functions. And that's why they start with a pretty good sense of what's going to be helpful for the DevOps teams. So combination of, you know, that shift left of having the right skills on the team to know what needs to be built and fast feedback, um, I think is, is what should result in the best possible platform. Great. All right. Team of teams like a network is good for complex work. How do you view the teams and what is the best today and what do you expect in the future? Can you start that one again? What was that first yeah. sentence here? Team of teams like team a network team. is good for complex work. Yeah. How do you view the teams and what is the best today and what do you expect in the future? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a couple of different ways I can talk about that. Um, when you have independent autonomous teams, you need some way to coordinate them. And your team of teams, the, the book itself, actually, uh, one of the main threads through the book is how to coordinate those teams, let's say in Iraq or, or wherever, um, knowing that they're going to be autonomous teams, how do you keep them in sync with each other and make sure they're all working together to solve the bigger problem? And I think that's, that's an interesting question also in a corporate environment, large corporate environment or a government agency environment. And there are a number of different approaches taken to that. Um, I love the example of AWS where I work, where um, the concept is we have autonomous two pizza teams. We have a lot of them. Each of our services, each of the, essentially the products that we offer has a service team that's responsible for that product or that service. And uh, those teams are quite autonomous, yet they are collaborating and all working towards the same goal. And the way we do that uh, is a combination of a few things. The first is we always start from a set of principles that everybody shares across the organization. We have 14 leadership principles. These are not just slogans on a poster on the wall or, or anything like that. These are leadership principles that drive everything we do at all times. We hire people based on those 14 principles. We manage our, our employees based on those 14 principles. We talk about them, we use them day to day as a way to make decisions. So because everybody is driven by those 14 principles, in a way management doesn't even need to worry about what uh, a team, an autonomous team is doing because they know that that team will be acting in accordance with those 14 principles. We also have something we call tenets, which uh, really are team specific principles that they are going to use to guide all of their decision making. And those are known, circulated, you know, it's part of the, the justification for their existence in the first place. So we can rely on the fact that they're going to be using those tenets as well to make, make decisions. So that's, that's uh, one way, let's say, that we, we keep everybody in coordination. Another way is through mechanisms that we've standardized that we use all the time. So it's things like our, uh, our equivalent 
equivalent of the annual planning process, which we use largely to get everybody in sync and to decide where uh, where to put our investments. Uh, we call that OP1 and OP2, uh, but it's a process that we've used for a while that focuses on um, how we're meeting customer needs and what um, what coordination we need between teams, what resources we need for each team in order to accomplish those customer outcomes. So that's another mechanism that we use. Um, we have other things, for example, the concept of an away team uh, as opposed to a home team. You know, the idea is if one team is depending on another team for something and the other team doesn't have the resources to do it, this team can send an away team to work with the other team and you know add essentially add their own resources to the um the the work that needs to be done by that other team uh so we have we have a number of things like that that help us keep things in coordination and then we have um sort of centralized um you know, mission objectives let's say so for example every service team has been told that they should try to reduce the costs of their service so they can pass those cost savings on to customers. And that's just a you know, general strategic imperative for all teams to work with. It comes centrally. There aren't a lot of those things aside from the, the leadership principles, uh, but it does make sure that, that certain things are, are kept consistent uh, across the enterprise and that things that are really high priority get done um, so I think that's a good example of one way to do the coordination between different teams. And would you consider, I, I think you're going to say yes, of course, but are these, all these things are bureaucracy, right? These principles and mechanisms you talked about, would you consider those all bureaucracy? Uh, yes, um, in the, in the sense, uh, so of course, in, in my sense of what a bureaucracy is, right? It's, it's, um, fixed rules and fixed roles essentially. And in this case, the fixed rule is that here's the mechanism you use. Uh, for example, the OP1s and OP2s. That's, you know, that's the way we do it. And every year you're going to do an OP1 and an OP2, and it's going to go through a certain process and, and get uh, assessed in a certain way. Um, so it's bureaucracy that provides a good structure uh, a, a shared set of mechanisms and so on. And I, I think it very much is bureaucracy. Now, um, it's designed very much to be enabling bureaucracy. So uh, in a way, like take the OP1, for example, um, what that says is to a team, if you want to get more resources, here's how you do it. You know, it's enabling in that sense. Um, we have something else called our press release in FAQ, the PR FAQ. Uh, which essentially is how you propose a new project. It's the, it's the mechanism or the form that, that you use when you have a new idea and you want to try to get support for it. So it's bureaucracy in that sense, but it's so enabling because anytime I have an idea that I want to try to get support for, I know exactly what to do. I make, I make a PR FAQ for it and I start circulating it and building consensus around it. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great example of enabling bureaucracy. All right, let's move on to another question. Um, let's see. Can you elaborate on the FADS discussed in M1's Provoke the Monkey? And is the FADS available online? Hmm. Um, yes and no. Um, so to a certain extent it is because government procurements are public, public information. Uh, so FADS was a procurement concept that we used to try something new in our agency. The problem we were trying to solve was we had one contract that, that was not very good. <laughs> uh, it took us three years to negotiate this contract. It was a huge thing, um, starting at $500 million, awarded to a single contractor uh, for performance over a five-year period. And what happened was once the contractor received that award, in my opinion, they uh, sat back and said, okay, now, you know, they're not going to replace us. It takes three years to, to do something like this. So 
let's put our stupidest people on the project, you know, and take our time and whatever. Um, so uh, there was a disincentive to perform in that, that structure, I thought. So we said, how can we not put ourselves in that situation again? And we came up with, after lots of um, brainstorming and collaborating, we came up with this idea for FADS where we would award the same contract to four different contractors at the same time. And uh, it was a contract to supply DevOps teams and uh, originally scrum teams. And then later on when we learned a little bit more DevOps teams. Um, and we said, we're gonna need a bunch of teams and we're gonna start out by getting two teams from each of the four contractors. And we're gonna evaluate how well they do and every six months, we're gonna readjust the number of teams from each contractor. So the contractors that are doing the best will buy more teams from them and the contractors that aren't doing so well will buy fewer teams from them. Uh, and we'll just keep readjusting it every six months based on performance. And this way we can grow, we can scale up and add more teams. We can scale down, uh, have fewer teams. And we can have an incentive for each contractor to make sure they're doing the best uh, and to show us that they are. And it turned out to work really well. Um, and the contractors actually liked it. It sounds like it would be a rough environment, but they loved showing us how good they were compared to the other guys. Um, and we, we pulled a, a really special trick, I think, in the way we set it up, which is you, you'd be afraid with an environment like that, that the contractors are just going to point fingers at each other. They're going to try to show that the other guys aren't doing a good job. And so we said, one of the factors that we're evaluating you on when we decide whether you're doing a good job or not is how collaboratively you work with the other contractors who are holding this contract. So it was a co-opetition sort of scenario. Uh, and that was effective also, we found. Um, so that's what we did. Um, I've spoken about it. Other people from my agency have spoken about it. Is there something online that is, um, you know, a, a, that provides details really? Um, last time I checked, there wasn't, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I hope there will be. And uh, if I can, I'll see what I can do to get more details. The, the contract itself, I believe, is online or the, the RFP that the contract was based on. We'll poke around and see if we can't find that link for everyone and we'll post it in the slack channel later if we do all right mark how do you handle knowledge as in knowledge management a software engineer can be described in a body of knowledge but even that is a huge area nasa is working with graphs for knowledge management how do you handle knowledge management if you want to develop yourself um I was not really in a position where a formal kind of knowledge management was a big issue. I think actually we, we kind of did have that for adjudicators of immigration benefits. Um, we wanted them to be able to share knowledge um, and best practices and so on. So uh, we did have some uh, informal ways to do that. Uh, it wasn't a central priority for us. So we didn't, we didn't work on that that much. Um, in terms of um, getting people educated on good practices, good DevOps practices, for example, up-to-date IT practices, um, we, we did a number of things. We, uh, first of all, we brought in coaches uh, to work with people. And I would say um, that, was, that was quite successful at getting us a good start at some point that that stops being quite as effective so it was it was a good way to to get the kind of cycle of knowledge going let's say um we we often had our people who became good at something present to others and not just within our organization but across the federal government and this uh, had a, a couple of effects. One is that it made them feel really proud of what they had learned and accomplished. And um, when they went out to other government agencies, they always came back and said, like, I can't believe how far behind those guys are. You know, <laughs> we're, we're really doing something good here. Um, but it also forced them to um, think deeply about some of the things they learned so that they'd be able to present it to other people. 
that was effective. The most effective thing for anything technical I found is um, pairing or direct experiential learning. So if you've got, let's say a small group of people who are really good with the skills that you want everybody else to have, you arrange opportunities for others to work alongside them and thereby pick up some of the good ideas. So there are a couple of different models for that. One is the dojo model that was used at Target and has been used by a lot of organizations since then that Ross Clanton taught me all about, um, where teams rotate in to work with the dojo on a project. They did, I think, six week rotations. Uh, so they'd work alongside each other and then the team would go back to what it was doing and another team would rotate into the dojo. Um, so that was a good way to spread practices. Um, I've always liked the model that Pivotal Labs uses in their consulting um, uh, arrangements. So uh, the customer that has a project it wants Pivotal to do also sends a team from the, the customer company to Pivotal. They work alongside the Pivotal people on the project. And they, uh, because they're working at the Pivotal headquarters and alongside those people, they get the feeling that all of these techniques are just normal. Everybody's doing it. You know, these are just good practices and it works across a variety of organizations. So they, they sort of meld into the culture of doing things in the new way. Uh, and then they bring those practices back to their companies. Uh, so there, there are a bunch of other models for doing this, but it, it's the direct experiential thing that works really well. I found a great example of where we, we had to do it was uh, DevOps techniques for automated testing. So if you have software developers who aren't used to writing automated tests, then they have a lot of trouble come up, coming up to speed on it. Their first reaction is, oh no, this will slow me down. I can't do that. Um, and then there, you know, it just takes them a while to get good at it. But if you can pair them with somebody who's already really good at it, then they see that it doesn't slow them down. It actually speeds them up and they learn the, the basic techniques that they're going to need. So that was a big one for us. Um, so I think I'm giving you a whole bunch of different tactics rather than a, you know, an overall answer to it. But those are some of the things we tried that worked really well. Great. Let's see, can you tell us what the biggest pushback you received with these, with these ideas has been and how you've handled that? Hmm. Uh, well, with the bureaucracy busting ideas, it was 100% pushback all the way through. And that's why you know, we, we developed these, um, these ideas. I, I think the hardest thing to change is the um, investment oversight aspect of things. So um, the, uh, over the time I was in government, we solved problems one after another after another. You know, we figured out how we're gonna handle this, how we're gonna handle that. But the one that took us longest to solve was how to deal with governance at the highest levels. Um, so the idea of making a business case and vetting it through a governance process and then executing according to that plan um, that is really hard to overcome in the big picture. And uh, I think we did, in the end, we did it quite well by showing another model that gave the overseers everything they really needed, but yet allowed for lots of flexibility and lots of agility downstream. Um, but maybe that's a, a long story, how we did that exactly. Um, that's where the, the biggest resistance tended to come. Now, um, in another sense, there are certain areas of the bureaucracy that you're not, you're not going to change. Um, and what you can do at best is, is make changes around the fringes, try to make those things more lean. Um, you know, there are a bunch of things you can do to improve um, the, the bureaucracy so it's not in the way so much. But um, things like expense reporting, um, which, you know, it's con there are controls and the controls are coming from the CFO and they're there for very good reasons. And, um, you know, at best you, you find better ways to automate it and better mechanisms for making it go smoothly. In the government, um, this might surprise some people, but ethics are a really big thing in the government. 
And there's a lot of bureaucracy to make sure that people are behaving ethically. And uh, that's not going to change, and I hope it doesn't. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things that's going to be part of the government. And um, I don't know, so um, uh, uh, you can't have a contractor give you a present, right? That would be bribery. Uh, but the government had to define what a present is. And it turns out that any time a contractor gives you something that's worth more than, or actually in, in a year, they can't give you things that are worth more than $25 altogether. Um, so there's all sorts of bureaucracy around that. Uh, people couldn't treat me for meals, for example. So it was a, you know, sort of a running joke, even, even my friends, um, you know, just to avoid the appearance that I was doing something wrong, I would not let them treat me for anything. Um, and, uh, you know, this $25 limit meant sometimes you had to, you had to test, not testify, but you, you had to assert that it, uh, the things you received were not worth more than $25. So there's a lot of bureaucracy around it, uh, but I love it. You know, I think that's the way things should be. Great. Um, I think we have just about maybe 10 more minutes left. So let's see here. What's your opinion on agile frameworks at scale, uh, including industrial DevOps? For example, Safe, Scrum at Scale, LESS, DAD, Scrum of Scrum, and Essence. I'm probably pronouncing those all terribly. And what is useful for a company with cyber physical products like Tesla? Mm. So uh, on the first question, um, I suggest that you don't just listen to me blindly and, and uh, you know, follow what I'm saying, because I have opinions on these things. There are people I respect who disagree with me. Uh, so with that as a preface, I think those frameworks, the ones that I know that you mentioned, I, I'm not a big fan. And uh, I'm not a big fan because they give the appearance of bureaucracy. They give the appearance of something formal and very controlled. And that's why organizations tend to like them. But in doing so, I think they compromise the spirit of what we're trying to do, which is really simple. Uh, in, in the agile world, we're trying to constantly inspect and adapt. And uh, I think, uh, in, in DevOps, it's that, and it's also have a very fast time, uh, lead time for, for releasing capabilities. So you can have fast feedback cycles. Those are the things that we're trying to do. And if you take a framework that says, um, well, we're gonna, we're gonna have, um, I don't know, increments and, and there's gonna be a release train and it's gonna have, you know, it's gonna be this much time long uh, and, and we're gonna have this, uh, amazing picture that shows how requirements flow from up here to down here to down here. Um, I, I think that's sort of missing the point of let's stay nimble, let's do things really quickly and get them out to users or to customers. And um, the, the additional structure, while there's a sort of comfort behind it, um, it's uh, more structure than you really need or want. Uh, I was gonna say, for example, on the speed question, the short lead times to get stuff into production, um, that implies to me, you wanna optimize your cycle time. You wanna, you wanna keep you know, shrinking the time it takes and focus entirely on that. Whereas if you have this uh, fixed cadence, you're not that focused on getting each individual requirement out to users as quickly as possible. So I think it, it works against some of what we're trying to do. Um, but mostly it's, it's just a, um, a thing that, that I think uh, tries to make people feel comfortable because they're not used to being agile and maybe that's the wrong general approach. So that's my feeling on that. The um, companies like Tesla that, that are dealing with hardware and software, um, here's where I have to say my experience just doesn't prepare me to give you a good answer to that. Um, it would be irresponsible, I think, for me too. Um, I, I think there, um, there may be ways to reduce the um, rigidity of having to work in hardware, but I'm not an expert on how one does that. And uh, I think the principles stay similar, that you want fast feedback cycles wherever you can. 
Um, you want to test ideas before you fully commit to them and so on. I view anything that gets in the way of doing those things as something that causes risk for you. Anything that is a bureaucratic impediment is a risk. Anything that slows you down is a risk. Uh, but sometimes you have to take risks. They come with the territory. Um, so I think that's the best I could do for you on that one. Uh, teach me when you figure it out. Okay, great. <laughs> um all righty let's do about maybe just one more question here um in what ways do you measure the success of the books you've written so far are you aiming for something more than selling a lot of them i hope i'm not sounding facetious yeah no 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 <laughs> um uh selling a lot of them is kind of a sign of success not in itself but it, it usually means that word of mouth has been good Right, that's how that's how these books sell primarily is through word of mouth, and so when they sell a lot, that says to me that people are recommending them to other people, which means they like them, and that's or found them useful, and that's that is a measure of success. Um, uh, what I really love is when people tell me things like this book changed my life, and here's how, and I get some of those. Um, you know, here's the struggle that I had. Here's how I, I took a lesson from your book and here's how it affected me. It's the, it's the anecdotes that, you know, are the really powerful ones, I think, for any of us. Um, if you, if you want to become rich, don't do it. Don't try to do it by writing books like these because um, that's, you know, they, they aren't going to make anybody rich. Um, you can, you, can uh, you know, have some success, but it's not a, a good reason for spending all the time it takes to write these books, just that you're gonna make money from it. Um, so what I'm looking to do is change people's way of thinking. And um, that change has a lot to do with um, empowering people to be successful. And so that's, that's really what I'm looking for. There isn't always a great way to measure it aside from anecdotes. Great, Mark. Let's see, do you have just another five minutes for us? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, can you give a overview of the DevOps agile knowledge sector? Knowledge sector? I I'm not sure I understand. Saying, um, other places they, they can get more research, no. books, conferences, etc. Ah. Uh -huh. Um, boy, that's in some ways an easy one. You should attend the DevOps Enterprise Summit, which happens twice a year, organized by Gene Kim and IT Revolution. There was just one last week. Was it last week? Um, and uh, they happen when, when it's not COVID times. One is in uh, Las Vegas and one is in London each year. And that is great because it is a... Um, a collection of non-unicorns, the horses. It's the big companies who are not necessarily technology companies and how they're doing DevOps. And so it's, it resonates strongly with, uh, you know, people who are in that situ situation. Um, so that's one thing. There are a number of books that are um, uh, sort of the basics and then a number of books that are you know, more advanced conceptual ways of thinking about what we're trying to do in DevOps. And so I think IT Revolution has been leading in publishing new thinking around DevOps. And so their whole catalog is great stuff. Some people that I respect a lot. There were some uh, sort of the original pioneering uh, books around it one of which was The Phoenix Project by Gene Kim, which is an IT revolution book. There was also stuff that was written by Jez Humble um, and uh, annual state of DevOps reports by Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jez and whoever else was involved, Gene, I think, in some of them um, that are great reading. Uh, and I often refer people to them. Um, one other recommendation that I think is often overlooked, uh, I really love the book Impact Mapping by Goiko Ajic. Um, that is spelled G-O-J-K-O-A-D-Z-I-C. The book is Impact Mapping. And uh, I've used that as the basis 
this for a lot of um, the, the uh, experiments that I've tried. So look that one up. It's a really quick read and Goiko is a genius. Uh, so offhand, those are some of the things that I would think of. Great, Mark. Thanks so much for joining us and participating in this lovely little AMA. There's a few other questions I think would have longer answers that <laughs> I'm going to send over to you after uh, this and see if maybe you can't write out the answers in the coming few days, if possible. I sure. you know you're a yeah. busy guy. I will try. And uh, do you want to say anything else to the audience before we say goodbye, how they can get in touch with you or anything like that? Um, go ahead and connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm there. I'm easy to find. Uh, and uh, also through AWS. Um, generally, if you have an AWS account manager who your company works with and you tell them that you would like to talk to me or get some more information from me, they can easily find me and, and see if we can arrange it. Well, great. Once again, thanks so much, Mark. Uh, Book Clubbers, I hope you've enjoyed. We're gonna be recording this and sending it out afterwards. And feel free to submit any more questions over on the Slack channel for each other. Have a great day, everyone. See you all. <laughs>